In this video, we'll delve into the spectrochemical series and the concept of electron pairing energies, both of which can be used to rationalize the properties of transition metal complexes. Both of these concepts also have some basis in crystal field theory. In previous videos, we showed that one can derive the d orbital splitting energies for transition metal complexes contained in a number of different coordination environments. In this video, we'll start to apply those concepts to understand the properties of transition metal compounds. One of the motivations for the development of crystal field theory was to understand the properties of transition metal compounds. For example, why do transition metal compounds display different colors, which in turn are reflected in their electronic absorption spectra? Why do they display different magnetic properties? That is, why do they behave differently from one another when placed in a magnetic field? And why do they display vastly different reactivities from one another, such as the different kinetics that they display when looking at ligand exchanges? One can rationalize some of these different properties through the lens of crystal field theory. In this video, we'll address the first two of these properties, color and magnetism. In the next video in this series, we'll address the concept of ligand exchange kinetics. Let's start by looking at the absorption of light by a transition metal complex. The factors that lead to the different colors of a transition metal complex are multifaceted. One of the major influences is the color of light that a compound can absorb, so the energy of light that a complex will absorb. For example, cobalt-3 hexafluoride is green because it absorbs red light, so you see this broad absorption band in the low energy region of the uv vis spectrum. We can look at a series of cobalt-3 compounds and see that they all have different colors because they all absorb different wavelengths of light. Going from the hexafluoro compound to the hexacyano compound, one sees that this absorption band progressively goes to shorter wavelengths of light. Therefore, that band is increasing in energy as we go from the hexafluoro species to the hexaaqua to the hexaamine to the hexacyano compound. We can rationalize this shift in this band by focusing on the d orbitals. This feature is ascribed to what's called a d to d transition. A good way to think about this is that a molecule will absorb a photon of light when the energy between two different states matches the energy of that photon. What we're doing in this D to D process can be thought of as a nominal promotion of one D electron from a low energy orbital into a higher energy orbital. For these cobalt-3 compounds, we'd be taking an electron from the T2G set and promoting it up into the EG set. Therefore, we can rationalize the shift in this band to higher energy as an increase in the crystal field splitting energy as we go from the fluoro to the cyano compound. We've increased 10 dq, or delta O, upon going from fluoro to aqua to amine to cyano. What we have done here is we've created a small spectrochemical series. It is a series of ligands that is influencing the value of 10 dq and is hence influencing the molecular and spectroscopic properties of the molecule. In this series, we say that fluoride is a weak field ligand and cyanide is a strong field ligand. This is because fluoride is producing a small value of 10 dq, so a small splitting between the T2G and EG sets, while cyanide is generating a large value for 10 dq, so a large splitting between the T2G and the EG sets. What we see here for the cobalt-3 complex is holds in general across all transition metal compounds. Fluoride is a weak field ligand, cyanide is a strong field ligand. We're now going to look at the spectrochemical series in more detail. One can define a spectrochemical series based on either the identity of a ligand about the metal or the metal itself. 
If we look at a large library of ligands, the spectrochemical series for the ligands follows this general trend where I minus is the weakest field, so it produces the smallest value for delta O, and carbon monoxide is the strongest field, so it's gonna produce the largest value for delta O. The reasons for this trend cannot be explained within a crystal field model because this crystal field model is ionic or electrostatic in nature. It ignores the covalent portion of bonding between the metal and the ligand. However, we can make some general observations. In general, weak field ligands are pi donors. What that means is those are those ligands that have lone pairs that have pi type symmetry that can interact with the metal center. Strong field ligands are what we call pi acceptors. This means that they have low, filled un low energy unfilled orbitals that have pi type symmetry. Those that are in the middle we call intermediate field ligands, and these largely lack these p-type orbitals or pi-type orbitals that can interact with the metal center. These are by and large what we would call sigma-only donors, meaning that they react only in a sigma-type fashion with the metal center. We'll be getting into this in a lot more detail when we discuss ligand field theory. If we look at how the metal influences delta O, we can make some general trends. In general, as you increase a metal's oxidation state, the value for delta becomes larger and larger. So low oxidation states produce small values for delta, high oxidation states produce large values for delta. Also, as you go down a column, the value for delta increases. So for example, iron 2 plus is going to have a small value for delta O, while osmium 2 plus will have a large value. Ruthenium will be in between the iron and the osmium ion. One thing that should be pointed out is that in general, cobalt 3 will yield a large value for delta O. In an octahedral environment, it will generate a low spin species most of the time. We're going to get into the discussion of high spin versus low spin, but low spin is when you pair up all of your spins. You can determine whether or not something is high spin versus low spin by taking a magnetic measurement of that compound. In addition to the optical properties, so the colors that these transition metal compounds have, their magnetic properties can also be rationalized to a first approximation using a crystal field model and counting the number of unpaired electrons. One way in which you can determine the number of unpaired electrons is by doing a magnetic measurement using a magnetic susceptibility balance in which you would derive the magnetic moment for a molecule. A magnetic susceptibility balance has an electromagnet that you can turn on and off. You can place that sample in between the poles of the magnet and then measure whether or not it's going to be attracted to or deflected from that magnetic field by whether or not the balance will push against a weight or pull on a weight. So here we're going to turn on that magnetic field and we're going to see what happens to these compounds under two different situations. And those two different situations are if we have a diamagnetic or a paramagnetic compound. A diamagnetic and a paramagnetic compound will tell you how many unpaired spins your molecule has, and it can be differentiated from something that would be ferromagnetic versus antiferromagnetic by the fact that these compounds don't retain any of the memory of the external field that's been induced to them. So diamagnetic and paramagnetic compounds do not retain the memory of that magnetic field. In a diamagnetic compound, the compound is going to be repelled slightly by a magnetic field. A diamagnetic compound results when you have no unpaired spins. A paramagnetic compound, on the other hand, is attracted to a magnetic field. A paramagnetic compound will have one or more unpaired spins associated with the molecule. If a compound is paramagnetic, it will display a net magnetic moment. We can use this equation to estimate what the magnetic moment of that compound will be. So magnetic moment, mu SO, the SO means spin only, meaning we're only accounting for the electron spin in this model, is equal to n plus 2 times n 
take the square root of that value. In this equation, n is the number of unpaired electrons, and the unit for this is Bohr magnetons, mu b. So that mu b is the unit that the magnetic moment will possess. As I said, this is the spin-only value. In real life, what you'll see is that the magnetic moment of actual molecules will be slightly lower than this, for reasons that we'll discuss in future videos. What we're going to do is we're going to look at two related compounds. We're going to look at iron hexachloride and iron hexacyanide. Both of these contain a formal iron 3 plus, so it's a 3D5 ion, meaning they have the same number of D electrons. One displays a magnetic moment that's consistent with five unpaired spins, and the other displays a lower magnetic moment that's consistent with one unpaired spin. If we look at the nature of the ligands and think about this in terms of the spectrochemical series, what we have are chlorides, which are weak field ligands, so those are going to have a small delta O, and cyanides, which are strong field ligands, which are going to have a large delta O. This difference in delta O is influencing the number of unpaired spins that we have. And the reason has to do with something called a spin pairing energy, or just pairing energy. In the case of the chloro compound, all five of those electrons are going to be unpaired, and we're going to have a high spin species. In the case of the cyano compound, those five electrons, we're going to pair up as many as possible, leaving only one unpaired spin and a low spin species. The reason for this has to do with the magnitude of delta O versus a pairing energy. To understand the pairing energy, we're just going to look at two different orbitals, one from the T2G set and one from the EG set. In the case of the high spin species, we have one electron in one of those T2G orbitals and one electron in another one of those EG orbitals. They're not paired together in the same orbital. When we transition to a low spin species, we're now going to start to pair up those electrons in the same orbital. What this does is this introduces a large amount of electron-electron repulsion. Orbitals are orthogonal to one another, so they're non-overlapping. So what you can think about this is by placing these electrons into different orbitals, they can no longer interact with one another, and therefore they're not going to experience large electron-electron repulsions. By placing them in the same orbital, they can now interact, and you're going to experience a large amount of electron-electron repulsion. The amount of energy that it takes to place two electrons into the same orbital is what we refer to as the spin-pairing energy, or just the pairing energy. Molecules always want to reach their lowest energy states, so if it takes more energy to pair these electrons together than it would be to promote it into another orbital, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a high spin compound, with the opposite being true in the case of a low spin compound. Therefore, if the pairing energy is greater than delta O, then what you're going to have is a high spin species, because it's going to cost you energy to pair, more energy to pair them together than to promote that electron. If the pairing energy is less than delta O, then you're going to have a low spin compound because it's going to cost you more energy to promote that electron up into the EG set than it is to pair those electrons together. So this is why the hexachloro species is a high spin species and the hexacyano species is a low spin species. So to summarize, the relative magnitude of delta can be determined from the spectrochemical series, either in terms of a ligand or in terms of a metal. You can use the magnetic moment of a molecule to determine the number of unpaired electrons it has, and then you can rationalize the number of unpaired electrons a molecule has by considering the pairing energy relative to delta O. If the pairing energy is large relative to delta O, the complex will be high spin. If the pairing energy is small relative to delta O, the complex will be low spin. In the next video, we're going to look at something called a crystal field stabilization energy and try to rationalize some reaction kinetics based on the crystal field stabilization energy.